to our final uh, panellist here before we get into the event perspective is from Professor Jamie Wilkinson of the National History Museum. Uh, he's going to talk to us about green, vo green rock vectoring, which I believe means that you can figure out where the porphyries are by looking at green rocks on the surface of the ore body. Jamie, thank you. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Simon. Okay. So yeah, so quick, quick thanks to Simon and the team for putting this together. It's been a great, great session so far, and um, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to talk here and talk about this method of green rock vectoring and how it can be an important new tool for the discovery of major new copper deposits, particularly under undercover, which is the exploration frontier that we're dealing with at the, at the present time. And there's been a nice uh, bit of background to this talk provided by a previous speakers, especially Roger, first thing. Uh, Greg's uh, detailed um, introduction to porphyry deposits and, and a bit from Ian just now as well. So I'll be talking about the green rock prolytic environment um, that surrounds porphyry copper deposits. So a quick few uh, acknowledgements just to kick off um, to major sponsors, partners in our in the Load Laboratory at the Natural History Museum in London, BHP, Anglo-American and Rio Tinto that support a lot of our R&D work. Um, a lot of the work I'll be presenting today is, is um, developed from a long-term collaboration with CODES University of Tasmania over a decade and more um, in a series of Amira sponsored projects. So most of the work I'll be talking about has been uh, developed over a long period of time but is now being uh, applied ang in anger in exploration. So this is the kind of uh, animal we're after, this is Chukicamata in northern Chile, giant uh, porphyry copper deposit um, and the sort of target that any, any company would want to find in exploration. This was uh, basically the top of the porphyry was, was effectively at the surface. And that's, that's the, the problem we have now. Most of these major porphyry deposits, if they exist in the world, will have been found if they're, if they're uh, exposed at the surface. Much of the surface of the earth has been trod by, trodden by uh, exploration boots. So the challenge is moving undercover and how do we locate these giant deposits where we have um, the systems are actually buried at depth. And they may be better buried in many different ways. This is uh, desert sands in the Southern Gobi. This is an example just uh, along the lines of where, where Ian's just talking about in New South Wales. This is actually a picture of the uh, North Parks cluster of porphyry systems under the farmland there. Superior District in Arizona. This, these are a, a series of volcanic rocks, tufts, which, which buried the resolution deposit for, for many decades, even though it was in a very well explored porphyry district. And my own sort of spiritual home in many ways, in terms of my research at least, uh, the gravels of northern Chile. So much, uh, much of the areas of, of interest in terms of the prospective geology buried under more recent gravel. So how do we find these major porphyry deposits where they are undercover? So what I'll go through is, uh, is a quick summary of this uh, the sort of green rocks exploration technique, which is now allowing us to make some predictions from samples we can collect either at surface from or from shallow drilling um, that allows us using a geochemical approach to, to predict the center of a porphyry system and I'll illustrate it with a very simple um, cartoon so this kind of much more simplified version of, of what uh, Greg was presenting earlier on just to show us uh, where a porphyry deposit would form so this is kind of at the time of formation of the porphyry ore body you can see that sitting at depth so typically these system systems forming at several kilometers uh, beneath the earth's surface with a halo of proximal alteration around the traditional alteration halo that would have been used in exploration uh, for many decades based on the early models of Lowell and Gilbert and so on. And then this much broader distal alteration halo, propolitic or green rock alteration halo, which, which extends for several kilometers away from the ore body. And this is important because it's, uh, it, it's potentially a useful domain. It's, it's produced by the fluids that make the ore body. Um, and it has a much wider, uh, wider extent, but traditionally it hasn't been possible to explore within these rocks for the lack of suitable signatures. This just, uh, slide just emphasizes, emphasizes the importance of the, the scale of alteration and how it extends the target footprint. This is a, a slide from uh, Schudder in 2006, illustrating on the x-axis uh, contained metal, copper metal in, in porphyry deposits as a function of the, the footprint area of different components of the deposit. So I'll illustrate with a 5 million tonne contained copper deposit. And if we're just talking about the ore body itself, the typical footprint of the ore zone will be around about one square kilometer. So if you're targeting something undercover, that's the needle in the haystack. You're trying to find something that's about a kilometer, perhaps in area. And you may be working in an area of you know, several hundred square kilometers. So it's a hard target to find if you're having to drill significant uh, 
depth drill holes several hundred meters up to a kilometer potentially through cover to find it. If you go to the uh, distal, uh, sort of the uh, sort of surrounding sulfides, if you like, the weak alteration and weak mineralization, particularly the pyrite zone that surrounds the ore zone, you can extend that footprint to several square kilometers. If you go to the proximal alteration I just mentioned, you may get, get out to about 10 square kilometers surrounding the ore zone. But what the green rocks method allows you to do is to really extend that significantly further into, into an area more like 50 square kilometers potentially around the ore body. So it's a much larger footprint that's something you can hopefully intersect um, and then use the information to, to try and guide you towards the center. And I'll just illustrate that with, uh, with this cartoon. So this is our this is our porphyry deposit when it forms. We erode it down to where we might be at the present day. So the, the ore deposit is still buried in this particular example, but we have this surrounding area of alteration that we can sample at surface or we can sample it through shallow drilling. And using the information in these green rocks, we can make a prediction as to where this uh, center of the system is and hopefully put then a drill hole straight into the center. That's one scenario. Um, this is just another one. We're eroding it down. This time we erode down into the porphyry ore body, but it's then been covered by more recent um, sediments or volcanic rocks. And this is a harder challenge because now we have none of the altered system um, that we're interested in present at the surface. So we have to go through these cover rocks to even get samples of this uh, important domain. But we can do that so we can drill through, collect, get samples from our shallow drilling into these green rocks, and then they can guide us in and help us to predict exactly where the center of the system is and put our drill hole into the ore body. And I'll illustrate how that works in the, in the latter part of the talk just coming up. So this is what the green rocks look like. We've seen a few slides of, of some of these sorts of rocks already today. This is the propolitic alteration that we find in that uh, several kilometers away from a porphyry center, typified by the presence of epidote and chlorite. And that's why they have this green, green color. Two examples on the right, from the North Parks uh, system in New South Wales from samples collected by Adam Pacey in his PhD study there. Uh, we may also get uh, minerals like uh, calcite, and uh, calcite and albite and a whole load of others in the propolytic halo, but the most important ones for the green rock targeting are the, the epidote and chlorite, and I'll be focusing on chlorite for the rest of this talk. On the left, you can see some resin mounted polished blocks of these samples, which is the sort of um, uh, sample that we use during the analysis. The enabling technology for the technique is a combination of scanning electron micros microscopy and laser ablation analysis. Um, and using this method, we, are, we can identify the grains of interest in a sample, the minerals of interest, we can, and we can then analyze their trace element and major element composition. And, and it's important that we, the development of the laser ablation methodology, because this allows us to detect certain elements down to just a few or even below below parts per million levels and, and some of these elements are really low concentrations in the minerals that have proven to be particularly important in this uh, targeting method. So it's, it's the development of technology and the analysis of minerals at very high precision and at very low limits of detection that has detected a, a subtle fingerprint in these minerals at very great distances from a porphyry center. This is a uh, just one example really of, of how the system, how the, how the technique works. So if you focus on the right hand side first, this is a map um, of El Teniente, the major low world's largest underground porphyry copper mine, central Chile. And you can see the outline of the grade shell shown by the white, the white dashed line there. And the gridded map that you can see is a map of the chlorite composition um, for a whole load of samples that were collected around the El Teniente, El Teniente system in the propolitic halo in the green rocks. And the map is showing one of the ratios that we may use in this targeting method, which is the titanium lith lithium ratio. So it's the concentration of titanium in the chlorite divided by the concentration of lithium in the chlorite. And you can see how this perfectly maps out the El Teniente system um, with, a, with a high in this ratio right over the ore body. And you can also see how far the gradient in that ratio extends away from the center of the system. So you can, you can detect the center of El Teniente for several kilometers away in this ratio in chlorite. That's kind of illustrating how the, the technique basically works in terms of um, mapping out the center of a, of a porphyry system. And it's received quite a lot of attention. The, the, the method won an award from the IA, IET in 2014. Uh, there's been quite a bit of press coverage over the years. And, and you see Steve McIntosh from Rio Tinto down at the bottom left there, who uh, talked about this at the Diggers and Dealers a couple of years ago, um, as Rio Tinto are using this in their, in their exploration, um, as are the other majors. 
So a little bit more detail on how this works. So this is, if you look at this plot here, this is a, a couple of examples of um, data, one from Badahijau in green, just focus on that, and the, and the data in red, again from El Teniente. And this is a plot of distance from center. So to distance to the porphyry center where the samples were collected. And then this is a different ratio in chloride. This is the logarithm of the titanium strontium ratio as a function of distance. And you can see how the gradient um, shows how that ratio systematically changes with distance from the porphyry center. And you can make a simple uh, exponential fit to these sorts of relationships, which gives you an equation that allows you to make a prediction how far your sample is away from the porphyry center based on that kind of ratio. So how does that work? It's a little cartoon just to illustrate it. So on the left, you can see this is a, it's a, it's a sort of 3D targeting, if you like. So if you take a sample point and then you um, can calculate the distance that is away from the center, effectively that's, that's defining a sphere around that sample point. If you have multiple samples, you're looking at the intersections of those multiple spheres where all those predictions are gonna converge on a, a particular target. And the little cartoon on the right just illustrates that. So we've got a, a covered porphyry copper deposit um, under these gravels off to the, the sort of southeast corner, if you like, and we've got a, a mountain range with a little bit of the propolytic alteration halo exposed shown in green. And a regional sampling traverse collected samples across this mountain range. And then just a few samples in red have hit the edge of the propolytic halo. And there may be another sample in a, in a river catchment down here, and maybe a sample from shallow drilling. And the circles I've just put on are the predictions from all of those sample points as to how far away that sample was from the center. So imagine these are really spheres, but we're looking at map view. So there's a, a circular intersections at surface. And you can see how all of those, these predictions in this ideal case have converged on the center of the system and then the second drill hole goes straight into the center of the ore body. So that's basically how it works. And just to show that it really does work, what was done in the Amira projects was a series of blind test studies. So these were known systems where a company provided samples to the team where the minerals were analyzed and we made a prediction as to where the deposit might sit uh, based on the chemistry of the, the minerals in the samples. And this is an example from the resolution um, system that we've heard about earlier. We didn't know it was resolution when we were doing the work. This was based on just 12 samples that were given and um, that contained chloride that we could use. You can only, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, nine of them on this cross section view of the resolution ore body. And the predictions from those nine samples converged at the point that's shown by the yellow circle at the bottom immediately or directly under the center of the thickest part of the, the resolution system. So this was a blind test. We made a prediction as to where the ore body was from samples, um, much shallower depth, several hundred meters away from the edge of the ore shell from drill holes in reality that were already at several hundred meters getting on for a kilometer deep. Um, but from those, those samples, we could predict that the ore body was there present there at depth. So this is the kind of blind test that gave companies involved in the projects a lot of confidence that the method would work and could allow you to predict um, a hidden target at significant depth. So just to wrap up, um, the, the uh, team led the load, load group at the Natural History Museum uh, involved in several major projects, multi-million pound research projects that are working on porphyry copper deposits. One is was called Famous. And then this CUBES project is funded to work on sediment hosted copper deposits. So there's a lot of work being we're currently doing to develop a new understanding of the geology and also to develop new search tools for these major copper deposits, in particular porphyries, but we're now moving into sediment copper space. In the load lab, we provide operational green rocks exploration data for explorers. Um, so that data is feeding into exploration programs of the majors. And we're also getting involved in quite a lot of data analytics to interrogate the data uh, in more depth to assess not just uh, not just as targeting tools vectoring but also to assess the system fertility so to make predictions as to how well mineralized the system is before you even put a drill hole into it so that's me done um, help, ha happy to answer any questions in the Q&A and if you want to send me anything by email that's my email address on the slide there thanks very much Professor Wilkinson thank you very much